Aloha, I'm Yanji Denise. Welcome to Get Your House in Order, the show where we help you take care of the things that matter most. In this series, we'll cover a wide range of topics from health and wellness to financial readiness and preparing for every phase of life. Today, we're focused on estate planning. Should you have a will? Should you have a trust? Or perhaps both? We'll have an expert on to explain. But first, Paulette Ito of Hawaiian Financial Federal Credit Union is joining us. Thank you for being here. Hi there. This is really the core of Get Your House in Order, knowing what happens next. Absolutely. At Hawaiian Financial Federal Credit Union, we know how important it is so that everyone can get organized. But sometimes life happens and you kind of forget and you say, oh yeah, I'm gonna do it, and you forget. It's important that you start at any age, especially when you're younger, because that becomes the building blocks of your legacy. And when you get older, that's the story of your legacy. So we encourage everyone to get their house in order. And how do we do that? Well, first you come to our website. You come to hificu.com. We have a guidebook that you can download. It's totally free. You don't have to be a member to download it. And this is a guidebook to start you on your journey to building your legacy. You start filling out all the information in there and you can keep it in one safe place. Okay, and the guidebook comes in phases. Tell us about those different phases. Yes, we're gonna come up with four phases. One, the past, two, the future, then the present and miscellaneous. Sometimes things don't just fit nicely in the past or present. It's things, everyone has a kitchen drawer that they put their thingamajiggies in it. That's what miscellaneous will be. It's about marriage, travel at a certain age, pets, even divorce, even military um, service. Those are the different phases that will be coming out in our guidebook. Yeah, and the guidebook is interesting because usually when you think of uh, the kind of you know tools that an organization like you would put forward, they tend to be purely financial, but this is really much more comprehensive. Oh yes. We found that a financial plan is about money coming in and money going out, but you, look, you have to look at the whole person. You have to look at where they've come from, where they want to go, their hopes, aspirations, the where you worked maybe 10 years ago may define what your retirement may be later. So we have to know the whole person and it's about culture, traditions, and also planning. That's very important. So that's why you need to know everything about a person. And planning is what today's show is all about. Thank you, Paulette, for being here after the break. We're going to have a fantastic attorney to walk us through estate planning. But first, let's hear firsthand about why this process is so important. Aloha. My name is Robin Rogers from Honolulu, and this is my story. I'm going to talk to you about your parents' and grandparents' personal property items that will be handed down to you. These items may include photographs, art, collectibles, or small items that have special memories. For photographs, there may be a picture in the photo that you don't recognize, and your parents or your grandparents are the only ones who can tell you who they are. For artistic items, you need to know a little more about the item and where it's from. Knowing this information will be very helpful in planning your estate and trust. For example, my great-grandparents came to America from Germany in the mid-1880s. They were only able to carry certain items with them that reminded them of home. This tapestry is an example of an item that they brought, probably rolled up like this, making it easy to carry from place to place. My parents were born in the 1920s and lived through the Great Depression and World War II. Money was hard to come by, so items such as these were cherished to be handed down to the next generation. My mother took this tapestry to a framer, and the framer said it was valuable, but she viewed it only as an item that reminded her of her grandmother. My wife is from Hawaii, and we moved here in the 1980s. My parents wanted to be near us and the grandkids, so they moved here too. When my mother died in 2009, we found this tapestry, some art, and some collectibles with absolutely no information about them. So it is very important for you to talk to your parents and grandparents 
about their special items in the planning for the trust and the estate. Thank you. For all your money needs, Hawaiian Financial Federal Credit Union is here for you. Visit HiFiCU.com. Welcome back. Joining us now is Jennifer Okubo Polito, an attorney who specializes in estate planning. She also lectures at the William S. Richardson School of Law at UH Manoa. Welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. So I think a lot of people are confused. Let's start with the basics. What is the difference between a will and a trust? So I just wanted to start off with that everything I'm going to share with you today is um, general information, but everybody should always consult with an attorney because every, um, every situation is different. But basically, the difference between a will and a trust, they both address um, how to or who to appoint um, as a fiduciary, someone to settle your estate or to manage your assets during your lifetime. But, um, and, and also who will get everything when you pass away. But there are a few big differences between the two. Um, a will can still be subject to probate court as well as it only takes effect at your death and it will only govern anything in your individual name. A trust on the other hand becomes effective as soon as you sign it, so it's immediate and so it will govern anything that's titled in the trust and it is good during your lifetime and also at your death. So it tells the trustee how to manage your assets during your lifetime, who to provide for, and then where does it go after you pass away. Okay, and we hear a lot about probate. Why is probate something we want to avoid? Probate can be expensive, probate can take a long time, and everything is public record. So um, we always try to avoid probate as much as possible. Okay, and I think a lot of folks think, well, I don't have a lot of money, or I don't have a lot of property, I just have the house, or I just have a condo, or whatever it is. Do I really need all of this? Isn't that for people who are really rich? <laughs> yeah, you get that a lot, um, but probate will be triggered if you have real property of any value. So a lot of times I have clients who own vacant land on the Big Island or vacant land, California, Nevada, and it will trigger probate in any of those states. And it could be, the cost of probate could be the same as the value of the land. So in Hawaii, probate is triggered by real property of any value or cash or other assets of over $100,000 in just your name. So that's usually when a trust would be recommended is if you have those type of assets. Now what if you have just one surviving spouse or you only have one child that you want to hand it down to? You know, some people will say, well, I have that in a will. It's just going to that one person. Let's keep it simple. What do you say to that? So the will is a great start, but the will will not avoid probate. So probate court proceedings are triggered based on, like I just said, the assets that you have in your individual name. Now, a lot of times married couples may own everything jointly. And so, of course, when you pass away, everything will end up going to your surviving spouse. But if you own it as tenants in common or everything's in your individual name, your surviving spouse might still be your heir but we would have to go to the probate court in order to have everything transferred over. So it's a good idea to still talk with an attorney, share all your information so the attorney can give you the options that you have. It may not be the trust, maybe there are other options that you could do to make sure things run smoothly and you avoid probate court, but it's important to talk with somebody to get that advice. Okay, and how soon should you start that process? It's, you know, is it, do I need to be very old to start to establish a trust or is it basically as soon as I start to accumulate some assets? I think, well, as soon as you turn age 18, you are legally able to create such a document. Um, but it's usually going to be recommended, um, well, once you turn age 18, I would recommend a power of attorney and a healthcare directive for anybody who's age 18, regardless, even if you only have a penny to your name. But if you have minor children, you may not have as many assets, but you may want to identify who's going to take care of your minor children and manage the assets for your minor child, especially if you don't want it to be the father or mother of your minor child who you're no longer with. And then um, those who have assets as well, you would want to be able to make sure that you know everything is taken care of and you're avoiding probate and it's going to who you want it to go to. So I have clients who are 
um, single with assets, no family. I have clients who have not too many assets, but they have minor children, they're single parents or you know married with children. And I also have clients who are 80s and 90s because they've started way back when, but they need to update. Okay, well this conversation is just getting started. We're gonna take a short break. We'll have much more with Jennifer. Stay with us, we'll be right back. Remember, these tips are general information, but you should always seek advice from an attorney. Wills versus trusts. Both wills and trusts allow setting up a fiduciary agent or someone who will settle your estate after death. A will could still be subject to probate court, only takes effect upon death and only governs things in your individual name. A trust becomes effective upon signing and appoints a trustee to govern your assets during your lifetime and after death. Probate Court Probate court should be avoided if possible as it can take a long time, be expensive, and becomes part of the public record. In many states, probate is automatically triggered when you have real property of any value. In Hawaii, probate is triggered when you have real property of any value or assets exceeding $100,000. Setting up a trust in these scenarios is highly recommended. Long's Drugs is always here for Hawaii, providing your family with their local favorites, accessible health and wellness services to keep you safe and healthy. Make Long's a part of your day. Beachside Roofing, the leaders. Welcome back to Get Your House in Order. We are speaking with attorney Jennifer Okubo Polito about estate planning. Now, Jennifer, we did talk briefly about probate. Typically, if you end up in that process, how long does it take? So it varies. Um, we can have simple matters that can be over within one to two years, but you can also have probates that drag on and on and on for years. It just depends on the situation. Um, typically, though, to be appointed as a personal representative, even a simple probate can still take a few months to get you appointed. Wow. And in the meantime, you're dealing with grieving, you're dealing with having to plan all the, you know, funeral arrangements and what have you. And if there are children involved, all those assets are basically frozen. Yes. Yeah, that can be pretty troubling. Tell us a little bit about, okay, I've decided to establish a trust. What do I need to do and how long does that typically take? So I, it would probably vary between attorney and attorney depending on who you go and see. Um, I typically have clients fill out a questionnaire that gives me a lot of information about themselves. So I know what kind of assets they have, what their family situation is. Um, and then I'll schedule a meeting with them to talk with them, to go over all of that. Um, and for me, usually one to two months um, on a, on a average basis we can kind of get documents together and signed but there are some times where it takes a little bit longer it just depends on scheduling or it just depends on you know sometimes people need a little bit more time to think about things because there are big decisions that you're making on who's going to take care of your kids or who's going to manage your finances who's going to make your health care decisions so some some folks need a little bit more time to think about it if they don't have um, you know somebody in mind already and what about the financials typically how much does this cost um, I would say, again, that would depend on, you know, attorney to attorney, but I think from what I've heard around the community, I'm guessing you're probably going to average anywhere between three to five thousand mm dollars. -hmm. Um, and if you have way more assets or a complicated estate, it might be a little bit more than that as well. Now, you did mention some other documents. We've been talking a lot about property, but there's also the idea of power of attorney and also your health care directive. Why are these important? So the healthcare directive would allow you to name an agent to make healthcare decisions if you're not able to. And it also documents your end of life wishes. So that's very important. It avoids us actually going to court to have a guardian appointed for you if you're in the hospital, unable to make your own decisions. Um, and you wanna be able to appoint somebody who you trust to make those healthcare decisions and document what would you want to do if you're in a coma and you know maybe you're not going to come out of a coma or you know what what would you like to stay on you know a ventilator and two feeding or, or would you like to just be kept comfortable and and um, be taken off those life-sustaining measures so that's important to make sure you have somebody and not when you're in crisis mode making these decisions but having some thought put into it as to what you would want um, and on the power of attorney side that helps to um, 
uh, name somebody to manage your assets for you if you're not able to do so. Without these two documents, we still end up in court during your lifetime. And that just sounds really tough. What are some of the biggest regrets you hear from the clients who come to you who don't take this action ahead of time, you know, before you're in the kind of crisis you're talking about? Well, sometimes they're, you know, maybe they're their loved ones in the hospital got a bad diagnosis and now they're trying to get everything done but I'm, I'm finding out that they're not um, competent enough or you know there's just not enough time to get it done so now they're facing well we have to go to court or we have to gather all of these assets and they don't know what assets maybe mom or dad had so it takes a lot more um, detective work a lot more time and you're already stressed because of the situation let's say you've established a trust you've got all those documents you've paid the money how often should the trust be reviewed I usually recommend every three to five years um, just because many times people would do it, they put it aside and then you forget about it or you forget what you put in it. Um, and so just taking a look at it and seeing what it is that you did and just because you review it doesn't mean you're going to update it or change it, but just to be able to look. Um, and also when there are maybe um, changes in, in your life situation, marriage, divorce, kids, death in the family, because they're, those people may have been named in your document in some capacity or another and so making sure that your documents are most up to date that would be important. And this is just a real quick practical question where should you keep this? Um, I always say in a safe place but that <laughs> question is always what's a safe place and I think many clients will choose to keep it in a safe deposit box um, because it's you know it, it's a safe place I always recommend though if you keep it in a safe deposit box keep a copy with you in your house because what I've seen before as well is you need authority to get into the safe deposit box and the authority that gives you <laughs> the documents that give you the authority is in the safe deposit box so if you have a copy you can show the bank that you are the authorized person to get in there but if you don't have a safe deposit box you know just keeping it someplace you know not in the kitchen not in the cabinet maybe someplace where you have you know your birth certificates your marriage certificates all your other important documents in the event of a fire my mom has her little bucket of things that <laughs> grab in case the house is burning and you run out if you can so yeah. <laughs> Good advice. Okay. Still ahead, Jennifer is going to share the one thing every family needs to know before starting this process. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Remember, these tips are general information, but you should always seek advice from an attorney. When to start. Regardless of assets, anyone who is 18 or older should create a power of attorney and a healthcare directive should something unforeseen occur. Even when you don't have a lot of assets, but you have minor children, you should appoint someone to care for your children and manage their assets in case something catastrophic occurs. Every family. Every family should have an important open conversation about where assets should go after a family member passes away, thereby avoiding potential surprises and even possible legal disputes during emotionally stressful times. Impact Wealth Solutions. Dream, plan, live. Windows Hawaii. Trust Windows Hawaii. Welcome back. Attorney Jennifer Okubo Polito is here to discuss how we should figure out what should happen to our assets when we need to pass them on. So, Jennifer, we teased this up before the break. Tell us what is the one thing you think every family needs to know as they start this process? Um, well, they, they should um, think about where they want their assets to go. I think that's the big question. And what surprises a lot of clients too is my, my follow-up questions are going to be, what if those initial beneficiaries have passed before you? Mm -hmm. Where do you want your assets then to go? So, um, you know, and, and I get a lot of questions of, should I have this conversation with my kids? Should I tell them? And I really leave it up to the clients because they know their kids best. Um, but having that open conversation with the whole family so there's no surprises after you pass away and you know, at, at that point in time, you're not there to answer any questions. And so that can really lead to a lot of disputes in the future as well. It's so interesting because the role that you play, it's not just attorney, it's really also sort of family counselor. You must deal with, I mean, there's a lot of emotion around this. Yes, and you know, we, we learn a lot too, that a lot of times, you know, children, um, 
when something happens after a parent dies, sometimes they go back, there's emotions from way back when, you know, mom always loved you more. And so, you know, you want to kind of address those ahead of time or think about that before, you know, how will your children feel about this or that? Yeah, and, and on that same, you know, in that same vein, who should know that you have this trust? Who should know that these documents exist and where they are? Because the thing that you don't want is people to sort of argue with you or litigate your decisions before you've had, you know, before you've passed on. Yeah, so I usually recommend at least your trustee or your personal representative, your prior attorney agent, at least if they know where to find your documents in the event they have to carry out your wishes. So. Um, making sure that they know that you've named them as a trustee um, and where to find those documents. You don't necessarily have to share all your documents with everybody because they are usually revocable and you can make changes at any time. So if you tell everybody you're a beneficiary and then you change your mind, it might become a little weird after you've passed away. But at least you're your trustee. Okay, and what do you tell someone who's on the fence about starting this process? Because it can be, as we said, it can be emotional, it can be tough to do. Yes, yeah, so I guess it depends on why they're on the fence to do it. If it's a cost thing, um, you know, probate is a lot more expensive or can be more expensive. And um, probate is more intrusive. So, you know, um, your heirs are all listed in the document and your beneficiaries are all listed. Address, full names, you, the documents show what assets you have. So if you want to be a little bit more confidential, it would make sense to, to do the trust. Tell me, what do you hear from your clients after they've gone through this process? It must feel like a huge weight is off their shoulders. Yeah, I've heard that many times. It's like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel much better about it. It's done and, and I can rest assured. Okay, yeah. thank you so much. Jennifer, thanks for being here today. We appreciate your time. We appreciate all of you for being here as well. Remember, you can review this show or watch it again by finding us on YouTube or listen as a podcast wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Yanji Denise. Until next time, take care and aloha. Mm -hmm.